Hey everybody, Steven here, and today I'm reviewing the Scepter C345B-QUT168 Ultra Wide Monitor. As always, I'll get into the specs first, and then I'll cover what I like, don't like, and the gray area before wrapping the video up. The C345B-QUT168 is a 34-inch ultrawide VA panel monitor with a 3440x1440p resolution, a 1500R curve, a 165 hertz refresh rate, and a one millisecond motion picture response time. The typical brightness here is 400 nits. Now this isn't certified for HDR through VESA, but this does have the ability to utilize HDR. And with that 400 nits, this would be HDR 400. There are no local dimming zones with this though. This does cover 99% of the sRGB color gamut. This has a 3000 to one static contrast ratio and a dynamic contrast ratio of 1 million to one. This is an LED edge lit backlight with a life of 30 plus thousand hours. For ports, this has two HDMI 2.0, two DP 1.4, and a headphone jack. This has two 3 watt speakers that I'll do a sound test for in a little bit. For the physical adjustments, this can only tilt and this does 15 degrees backwards and 5 degrees forwards. But if you do want more adjustments than that, this has a VESA pattern of 75 by 75 millimeters so you can mount this. The menu button is a single button on the bottom center of the monitor, which I do appreciate. And at the back of the monitor, you have two RGB light bars. Inside of the box, you will find the monitor, neck, base, scepter screwdriver, DP cable, AC adapter, and user manual. Now, scepter suggests that the retail pricing here is $499, but if you look on Amazon, it's normally $349, and it is currently discounted to $299. Next, let's do a quick sound test for the speakers here with the camera at a normal sitting distance and the volume adjusted in post to make sure that it better represents what this actually sounds like in person. Moving on, let's get into the menu here. The first tab is the quick start, and this will be most of what you'll find inside of the picture tab. So let's go ahead and just look at that. With this, you have backlight, brightness, contrast, presets, dynamic contrast ratio, aspect ratio, sharpness, motion picture response time, and the multi-window settings. Now I won't be covering everything in depth or even showcasing everything, but I do wanna look at the presets first here. To start, you have standard, user, movie, eco, FPS, and RTS. User mode will let you adjust the brightness and contrast, while the other presets have this locked. I'll be covering the motion picture response time in more depth with the overdrive settings in a little bit. So next, let's look at the multi-window, which you can change this between picture in picture and picture by picture. With that, you get to choose the source, and if it's picture in picture, you can adjust the size and position. Now, utilizing a console with this, if you are going to use picture by picture here, with their 49 inch monitor, it actually splits it into two 27 inch monitors. So the aspect ratio is that 16 by nine. Here, it is not that, and you can't adjust this. So what this ends up being is 1720 by 1440. So it's a very weird aspect ratio here. 
So I have my PC on the right, I have the PlayStation 5 on the left here, and then showcasing, hey, 1720 by 1440 native, and it also drops down the refresh rate to 60 hertz. You only have the option of 50 or 60. You don't get the 120 with this. Again, this has to do with the fact that this is a 21 by nine at 34 inches, and then you're splitting that in half. Now you can do picture in picture if you wanted to, and that will give you the 1920 by 1080, but then you're dealing with this small image on the screen. Now you can change the size of this, and it does give you again the 1920 by 1080, so it looks better, but that's more typically something that you would utilize to like PC sources versus gaming here. That way, if you're doing any type of workflow stuff, it's something that you could utilize for that. So for content creators, things like that, this can be a good option. Just looking at a console on this though, I'm gonna talk about it again later, but just keep in mind, you're stretching out a 16 by nine aspect ratio image to a 21 by nine. So it doesn't do native ultra wide with a PlayStation 5 or an Xbox or a Nintendo Switch. So you're stretching that image out. So just keep in mind, it's gonna look a little bit different if you run this like that. Or with, I think the Xbox, you can do the black bars on the side or sometimes it's in the game setting. So that is another option. So you can get the 16 by nine, but I don't know that that is going to be an option for every single game. And they've done a lot of updates in the last handful of months. So that may be something that isn't actually there with the PlayStation I didn't find that you had that option but I have done that in the past with an Xbox Series X up to you with this I think it looks decent but I can tell that this is a stretched out image where that may not actually bother you so if it doesn't this could be a good option for you in regards to utilizing a console on this next we have the color tab and there you have temperature the RGB settings Advanced, which unlocks more colors to adjust. You have gamma, tint, saturation, black level equalizer, and blue light shift. For the color temperatures, you have warm, normal, cool, and user. User unlocks the RGB settings for adjustment as well as the advanced colors, but it locks saturation and tint while the other presets will lock the color settings, but it'll unlock the tint and saturation. Last, you have the system tab, and here you can adjust overdrive, turn free sync on or off, enable HDR, adjust the light on the back of the monitor, adjust the sleep mode timer, adjust the on-screen display, and change the volume. Looking at the overdrive first, let's go back for a second and talk about the motion picture response time setting from the picture tab. With this, I personally prefer to keep it off as this makes the motion look smoother on screen in my opinion, but with this you have off, low, medium, and extreme. Running the UFO test, you'll notice more defined ghost trails as you increase this from off to extreme. The amount of ghosting here is pretty middle of the road when it comes to the VA panels that I've tested in the past. It can't compete with an OLED, but unless you're a hardcore enthusiast, I think most people won't notice it a ton when you're actually gaming. Now with motion picture response time, it isn't as fast as gray to gray response time either, but again, I don't think most casual gamers' eyes are going to notice a big difference here in terms of ghosting when it comes to playing games. Now adjusting overdrive doesn't seem to affect this at least to the degree that I can see with my eyes. And with overdrive, you are increasing the response time here. So with this, it should get faster. And this actually has off, low, medium, and high. And testing each of these with the four different motion picture response time settings, I didn't visually notice any difference. So how much that actually translates to performance, I'm not sure, and I don't really have the gear to test that out. So personally, I've left both of these off as it seems to be the smoothest experience in terms of the visuals when it comes to gaming, although it won't technically be the fastest. Now. 
Keep in mind, motion picture response time isn't available when free sync is turned on. So if you do turn that on, you're gonna nix that. So just something you can't adjust. And most of the gaming footage that I've showcased in this video is actually with free sync on with a G sync compatibility enabled. The motion picture response time is off again because it's not an option. And then I have overdrive off as well. Next up is HDR. I mentioned earlier, it's not certified by VESA in terms of making sure that it is HDR 400, but this does have a typical brightness of 400 nits, meaning this is at least HDR 400. I've tested it out. I'm not big on HDR. I've mentioned this in other videos. Now, if you have an OLED or if you have a mini LED where you have all the different local dimming zones and it does have the HDR 1000 certified, so we have a thousand peak nits or 2000 anything like that that's great and you can have a really good hdr experience in general though it takes a lot of adjustment to get it to at least my liking when i can just play in standard definition and it looks really good out of the box with all these monitors so if you want to spend the time to make all the adjustments it is there it can look pretty good with this monitor but it's one of those do you want to spend that time doing all those adjustments or not. Outside of that, the only other thing I'm gonna cover in this section is the light. You do get the adjustments for the light on the back of the monitor. They're not bright enough to really illuminate a wall unless it's close and you're in a completely dark room. It's nice little piece of flare with this. You get a nice little RGB touch on the back. You do get those adjustments that you see with a lot of their other scepter monitors that have lights, but you're not really seeing it. So that's always the downside here, unless there's just a ton of RGB lights on the back. So a nice touch, just keep in mind, I don't know how much you're actually going to be able to see it just because of the placement here and how bright it gets. So now that I've covered the menu, let's get into what I like about this monitor. And I have some good news with this. I don't have any standout negatives here. Now I have some gray area stuff that I'm gonna talk about in a little bit, but I don't have any just glaring negatives when it comes to this monitor, which is great. So I'm happy to say that Scepter has another solid monitor on their hands with good colors and performance out of the box. Now it's not going to compete with top tier OLEDs or these other monitors out there that have the one millisecond gray to gray response time regardless of whether or not they're a VA or an IPS or an OLED but with that you're talking about something that is double triple quadruple the price so I'm really looking at the price tier here and judging this based off of that now in terms of the performance it's not a one millisecond gray to gray response time but running the UFO test this doesn't have that large amount of ghosting or inverse ghosting going on with the settings that I've chosen that I talked about earlier now there is some, but again, I don't think most casual gamers are really going to notice this when gaming. If you're a hardcore enthusiast, you would probably notice it, but you're probably gonna buy something that is again, one of those higher tier monitors that are double, triple, quadruple the price tag here. So I don't know that this is going to be an enticing monitor for you. For everybody else, if you are a casual gamer, if you do workflow stuff, this is going to be a great monitor for you. And for workflow stuff, if you're writing, if you're doing any content creation, ultra wides are just great for that in my opinion. And with this, you get the 1500R curve, which just is very nice on the eyes. I like that level of curve. It's not as extreme as like a thousand R curve, but with a thousand R curve, it really only makes sense once you get up to like a 49 inch monitor, where here is just a nice curve that feels great on the eyes. And you do get the 99% of the SRG GB color gamut so it is very color accurate here so again if you're doing content creation or workflow stuff this is a great option for you that won't break the bank for console players I know that usually gets brought up at some point with ultra wides they don't support the 21 by 9 aspect ratio so I typically don't say to get an ultra wide if you mainly just game on a console with this though you do have the picture by picture option so if you did want to split this up and you had a console running on one side and then you had your pc running on the other that could potentially be an option just keep in mind it does change the aspect ratio and the resolution so you get that 1720 by 1440 and then your refresh rate changes also so you can only do 50 or 60 hertz 
or if you're just okay with either the console stretching out the image, which I don't personally think looks great, but it will just stretch that image out to fit the full aspect ratio, or you're gonna end up with black bars on the outside. It could work, it just, to me, it isn't usually the best option when it comes to consoles. So again, just keep that in mind before you get this. For PC gamers though, this looks and performs really good out of the box. I've personally been using the movie user and RTS presets for all of the footage here. I do like the fact that this has the 165 Hertz refresh rate here. And again, going back to the ghosting, I think for most people, it's not going to be something that you're going to notice a ton of here and all at a price that again is a fraction of the cost when compared to other 34 inch ultra wides that are on the market. Now it may not have all the bells and whistles of some of those higher end monitors and I'm not going to get into the weeds with comparing those things because it just at that point it doesn't make any sense because you're looking at price tiers that are so much more expensive than this and those features are just the, you're talking about apples and oranges at this point, right? So OLEDs versus VA panels versus IPS panels versus the amount of curve or if it's many LED versus LED, the amount of full array local dimming zone, all these different things, right? So the interesting part here to me is more looking at a monitor like this used to cost double to triple the price just three years ago with these same specs here. So with that, it's cool to see the evolution of the market and where it is going, but also these monitors that used to just feel out of reach for most people are now affordable. And I think that is really good to see with not only Scepter's brand and what they bring to the market, but other companies as well. But I do think that Scepter gives you the biggest spectrum in terms of their lineup when it comes to these monitors that again, we're taking tech that used to just feel out of reach for most people and we're making it affordable now. So shifting over again, I don't have any negatives here. And this is one of the main reasons because this is so affordable and it has solid performance to judge it as if it is the monitor that is double, triple, quadruple the price. That doesn't make any sense here. So instead, I'm now shifting over into a gray area where it's, these are things that I would hope to see out of Scepter and what they're bringing to the market here in the next couple years. I don't have standout gray area things with this that I would typically have with another monitor. Instead, again, just looking at the brand, it's almost more of a global thing here when it comes to these monitors. So I do hope down the road, we see a redesign when it comes to their monitors. And I do like the RGB lighting on the back and some of the different features that we get with these, but I think the molding here, just give it a facelift. I think we can go with just a new look just to mix it up in terms of the aesthetics. I do like the aesthetics with this product, but I'm at a point now where I've kind of seen this same molding for the last couple years. I think a, a redesign on this would be great to see down the road. In terms of the RGB lighting itself, it's not typically something I would expect on a monitor at this price point. So it's great that it's there. If we could get a little bit more or maybe make it brighter so that it does show up on a wall, if I have this monitor close to it, that would be great. So something I would like to see down the road as well, or maybe just shifting it. So maybe we get some stuff on the front as well. So you get to actually see it instead of it just being on the back of the monitor. I typically don't expect speakers with a monitor at this price point. The fact that it has just speakers is really cool. I think that's something that also makes it unique too, because typically you have to pay a lot more in order to get that with that. Uh, I, I think the, the trade-off here is usually you're getting, you're getting one thing, right? Maybe we get RGB lights and the speakers, but we're not going to get an adjustable stand. We're seeing other brands bring products to the market where you get a lot of those different things. So you end up getting speakers, lights, and an adjustable stand, right? So hopefully down the road too, we see some of their 34 inch monitors like this one, or at least just in general, I'd say a standard across the industry is adjustable stands. Most people may end up just VESA mounting that and that's great. And I always like when they do have it certified so that you know you can mount this to a monitor arm. But with this lineup and the ultra wides, they do have some with their gaming lineup. 
that have adjustable stands. Those are great. I would like to see that brought over now to this lineup where we're just seeing, and these are just kind of like, these monitors are for everybody. When you look at their Nebula series, which is like their gaming series, those ones more specifically geared towards gamers. This one is for gamers, but also for workflow and things like that. And of course you can use these forever, whatever you want, you could use these monitors, but I do hope that we see some of those features brought over. So again, we could get an adjustable stand with a lot of the monitors just across the board because the tilt is great, but usually height adjustment to me is more important because if you can't adjust the height, then you're going to need to either put this on a monitor arm or put this on some type of platform. So that's the gray area stuff here that I'm hoping to see down the road. In terms of the panels, maybe we get a mix up. I would love to see Scepter bring an OLED to the market just because I know it would not be like the other monitors that we're seeing right now that are just, again, they feel so out of reach. I think for most people, we would see something that is more affordable. So I am hopeful that in the next year or two, we do see that as well. And a selfish side note on that, a request from me would be extra USB ports, a hub on this, because I always like when a monitor has that just because I use so many different peripherals. So that is a big help. So hopefully we see that down the road as well. But for this monitor, I am happy with the product that they've brought overall. I'm hopeful that we see some of these adjustments in the next year or two, again, maybe a molding redesign, things like that. But for right now, if you're in the market for an ultra wide monitor, this is gonna be a great choice for you. Solid performance, solid colors. It's great for gaming. It's great for workflow. Big thing here is if you do need top tier HDR, this isn't gonna be the monitor for you. And if you do need to utilize this exclusively for console gaming, those consoles just don't support this aspect ratio. So something to be mindful of there, unless you're cool with this, either stretching out the image or just having the black bars on the side. So that is going to wrap this video up. If you do have any questions about this, let me know in the comment section so I can answer that for you there. If you do want to pick this up, I will have a link for this in the description. So you can do that also. If you like the video, hit the like button for me as it helps the channel out. If you want to continue to follow along with all my content, hit the subscribe button button for me. And as always, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.